Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In the conclusion to part three of his Prolegomena to Any Future Metaphysics, Immanuel Kant is going to bring up an important distinction and also apply it between bounds and limits of reason and by extension bounds and limits as such. So not every use of reason will actually have both of these and it's important to clarify this at this point and we're going to see that Kant will interestingly use spatial metaphors in order to try to bring this across, which we'll look at after we uh, examine the distinction itself. So what is the distinction? We have bounds, grenzen, which are often translated as limit. Grenz is uh, limit, but in this case, bounds or boundaries, right? And then we have limits proper, uh, shranken. You could think of those as not having the spatiality that we're looking at here. So bounds or boundaries, grenzen, as he says, presuppose a space, a realm, outside and enclosing what it is that they are bounding. And so he says, uh, outside a definite place. Then he says, limits, shranken, do not require this. They are actually mere negations, which affect a quantity so far as it is not absolutely complete. And this absolutely complete, the complete word there, you know, uh, this, is, this is the one that we've seen coming up over and over again in the previous parts of the uh, prolegomena. Um, this is a key idea running throughout the work. So how is this going to play out? Well, some uses of reason, some modes of cognition, some sciences even, are not going to have both of these. And so he says, as long as the cognition of reason, the cognition that is being carried out by reason, is homogenous, gleichartig, again, something that we've seen talked about previously. Where did that come up? Well, a little bit earlier in part three, when we were looking at the cosmological ideas. And here, just a little bit of a digression and reminder, there were mathematical antinomies, right? And then there were dynamical antinomies. And the mathematical had to do with things that were like Arctic, that were homogenous. That's why they could be about, you know, limitation of time and space, right? But, the dynamical ones weren't about things that were actually like arti in this way. So Kant is going to go on and talk about the two previous sciences, the uses of reason that uh, have been clarified in part one and part two of the prolegomena, asking the questions, how is mathematics, pure mathematics, actually possible? We know that it's possible because it's actual, right? Same thing with pure natural science or the natural sciences, unified as science. So both of these, he's going to say, um, in mathematics and natural science, human reason 
admits of limits, right? Negations of this sort, but not of bounds, not of grenza. That something indeed lies outside of it, which it can never arrive at, but not that it will at any point find completion in its internal progress. So mathematics, as he says, is sort of like infinitely extendable within the domain of mathematics. So it can't infinitely extend itself into everything else, but you can have new insights, new discoveries. They can come up. They're potentially infinite, right? We could do mathematics forever and still be discovering new things. And why? Because as he says, it uh, regards appearances only. We saw in part one that it has to do with the intuitions, the pure intuitions of space and time, right? And what we can derive within them. And so he says, what cannot be an object of sensuous intuition. And then notice what he's going to say here, such as the concepts of metaphysics, but there's another term that gets brought in and then doesn't get really talked about much here and of morals. <laughs> Interesting, isn't that? So uh, these lie entirely outside of its sphere. So we have a clear demarcation between mathematics as a discipline, which we understand quite well, and metaphysics. What about the natural sciences? The natural sciences seem a little bit closer to metaphysics, don't they? We could say mathematics, you know, that's all ideal. That's, you know, stuff that we don't actually have to be uh, seeing in, in nature. But, you know, natural science is about natural things. And we're kind of led to thinking, well, what's at the absolute basis of those? That's actually metaphysics. The way that Kant conceives of natural science or the natural sciences, which would, by the way, include what we often call the social sciences like psychology, um, insofar as they're you know, following laws that can be observable. He says that the same is the case with the discovery of any new properties of nature. We can make progress into understanding physical things, right? We can use a microscope and be like, holy crap, look at what's, what's being revealed to us. Salt actually has a crystalline structure. Isn't that interesting, right? But that's still within the realm of the phenomenal, what it is that we can experience and observe. So um, new properties of nature, new forces and laws, things that we use to explain how things turn out the same way over and over and over again. Gravity is one that uh, Kant or you know, mutual attraction of material bodies, uh, Kant has brought this up over and over again in here. Um, we can have these by continued experience and rational unification. That is something that we attempt to do in the sciences. We try to say, how are these things all connected with each other? Can we make sense of them? But the natural sciences, as he says, can never reveal to us um, the internal constitution of things. We can never get to the things in themselves. We can never get to the very bottom level and say, aha, within the realm of experience, we have discovered the metaphysical. So what about metaphysics? He says that metaphysics leads us towards bounds in the dialectical attempts of pure reason and the transcendental ideas as they do not admit of evasion and yet are never capable of realization serve to point out to us actually not only the bounds of pure reason, right? But the ways to determine those bounds. Now, do the transcendental ideas do that all by themselves? Do we say, aha, here you go. Here's a flash card with the various cosmological ideas on them. Here's another one with the theological idea. Here's another one with the psychological idea. No, we have to do the thinking about that that Kant has actually done in section three, part three of this work, the prolegomena, and also in the critique of pure reason, right? So metaphysics is doing something different than mathematics and natural science. Metaphysics does in fact 
have bounds, whereas these other two don't have bounds. They merely have limits. Metaphysics would presumably have both of those to it. And having bounds is going to be incredibly important as something determinative, right? And so he says that, you know, metaphysics in its fundamental features, perhaps more than any other science, is placed in us by nature itself. It cannot be considered the production of an arbitrary choice or casual enlargement in the progress of experience from which it is quite disparate, right? So what can actually find us these limits and these bounds? Reason. Reason working upon itself and producing for the first time, going all the way back to what Kant was talking about in the earlier parts of this work, a genuine metaphysics, an actual metaphysics, a critical metaphysics. And so here we're going to have to look at two spatial metaphors that he brings up. One of these is happening at the very beginning when he talks about bounds and limits he says that our reason sees in its surroundings, umzik, literally just around it, what? A space for the cognition of things in themselves. So reason can't actually attain to the things in themselves. It has to observe certain boundaries or bounds, certain grenze, right? But reason is the one who gives itself those, who recognizes those and postulates, we could say, or recognizes a space outside of itself or around itself, enclosing it that includes things in itself. And we should mention too, so I brought up morals. Kant, when he talks about things in themselves, one of the things in themselves that we can actually make some progress in, not fully determining, not fully cognizing, but at least grasping, is ourselves as freedom. That's a bit of a side note. Let's go on to the second metaphor, which is a little bit more concrete. So he says that uh, since the transcendental ideas have urged us to approach them and thus have led us, as it were, to the spot or the place where what? The occupied space, space that we can roam around in, the space of, he says, experience, touches the void. Now, notice that he doesn't say touches the void in the sense that the void is something there. It's, this is actually an adjective. So, zur, that's up to, right? Berur, berurun, right? Um, touching, uh, attaining to. Mit dem lehren, right? With, liter literally, with what happens to be empty or void, right? So he's not trying to determine what the void is, you can't do that because it's a void. Right? And that is going to be at the limit, or at, rather at the boundary, the grenze of uh, this thing that is being imposed on pure reason. He says we can determine the bounds of pure reason, right? Um, in all bounds, there's something positive. A surface is the boundary of corporeal space. Therefore, is itself a space. A line is a space, which, the boundary, which is the boundary of the surface, a point, the boundary of the line, yet always a place in space. Whereas limits contain mere negations. And so it's not just limits being revealed by these spatial metaphors or through uh, reason engaging with the transcendental ideas in a critical way. We're also getting to figure out what the bounds or boundaries of pure reason actually are in relation, as Kant is going to say, to the noumena, to the things in themselves, which we cannot determine, but we cannot escape either. 